Welcome to Zoom Special Features Training. We're going to go through a whole list of Zoom Special Features. There is a handout that goes along with this webinar and I will include the link to the handout on the screen here. Let's begin. First thing is how do you even get into Zoom? If you are at Nova, you're going to go to nvcc.edu, click My Nova, log in, And at the Tiles page, there's a new tile called Zoom. Click Zoom, click Settings, and you're in. Hopefully, before you watch this video, you've watched the Zoom for Meetings or Zoom for Instructions video. So I strongly recommend watching one of those prior to watching this video. With this video, we're going to go through a couple of special features. So on the left-hand side, first we're going to go through our Settings. So there is a long, and I'm not exaggerating, there is a long list of settings available here. But let's go through the ones we're going to talk about today. So the first one that we're going to talk about today is file transfer through chat. It's right here. This one defaults to off, and I know that because it's on and it indicates that it was modified. Turn this one on to enable file transfer through chat. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Scooting on down, the next one is co-host. Turn this one on if you would like to have more than one person available to co-host a meeting. We'll talk about what that does. The next one is polling. Turn this one on if you would like to add polls to meeting controls. Always show meeting control toolbar. This is optional, but what this does is it leaves the control bar open or on the screen all of the time. Otherwise, when you stop moving your mouse for a few seconds, the control bar hides itself. Some people find that annoying, so you can turn it on here. Scooting on down. Annotation and whiteboard. Annotation allows participants to use annotation tools to add information to shared screens. This one, by default, is on. And the whiteboard allows participants to share the whiteboard during a meeting. You also have the option to save whiteboard content when sharing is stopped. If you've done some brilliant things on your whiteboard, you can save them. Next one, nonverbal feedback. This one defaults off. Turn this one on and it adds little emoticons, little emoji kind of things to the participants panel. We'll show you what that looks like. Breakout room, this one is off by default. If you would like to split your meeting participants into separate smaller rooms, turn this on. And if you want to be able to manually assign participants to breakout rooms, hit the checkbox. Next one, closed captioning. This one defaults off, but I recommend that everyone turns this one on. And the reason why is because we are a government entity, we are subject to the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, which means any faculty, student, or staff member who requests closed captions for a webinar must be provided closed captions for the webinar. And you can't do closed captioning unless you have that setting turned on. The next thing is virtual backgrounds. This is more entertainment than educational but it allows you to change your background to any picture you want it to be. So you can make it look like you're out in space or whatever. We'll show you what it looks like. Scooting on down. This next one, attention tracking. This one also defaults off. What this one does is lets the host see an indicator next to the participant's name in the participant panel if the meeting attendee doesn't have Zoom in focus during screen sharing. For meetings, probably not a big deal. This would be with your colleagues and coworkers. It's okay if they're checking email during your presentation, I suppose. But if you're doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring or something like that, you probably would want to turn this on. You might want to turn this on so that you know whether your 2T, is that a word? The person that you're, tutor the person that you're tutoring is paying attention and participating. 
Waiting room, this defaults to off. If you turn this on, what it does is the attendees can't join a meeting until the host admits them individually from the waiting room. What you'll see is in the participants panel, everybody that's in the room with you in the active meeting room will be at the top. And then there'll be a subheader that says waiting room. And everybody who's sitting out in the waiting room will show up underneath the waiting room subheader. There's a button next to each name that says join to meeting. What you, might, what you might use this for is if you're doing student advising, you could just schedule one meeting and you're going to stay in there the whole time. So say maybe you're advising from 9 to noon or something. You schedule the meeting from 9 to noon, you jump in the meeting, you send the same URL, URL out to everybody who wants your time. And then as you see people arrive, you join them to the meeting room. As you're done with them, they either leave or you have the option to remove them from the meeting room. While they're in the waiting room, they cannot see or hear anything that's going on in the main room. So it's a way of managing individual appointments. Show a join from your browser link. You may remember back with WebEx. With WebEx, you had to install a driver to be able to run WebEx. And since most of us do not have admin rights on our computers, we couldn't actually install anything without the assistance of IT. But there was a link at the bottom of the screen that said, um, I think it said something like run a temporary link or join from browser or something like that. And that's how most of us would join our WebEx meetings. This is the same idea. So this gives people a join from browser link if for some reason they cannot download and run the Zoom driver it gives them a second option to be able to get into the room. However, the experience is limited. Um, <clears throat> they will not have the same full functionality that they would have had if they'd installed the driver. So for example, they don't see all the settings um, and, and a few other things. But if, if the point is really to just be able to see and hear something that's being presented, it works just fine. And then the last two things we're gonna talk about, scooting back up to the top, are recordings and reports. So let's start with that first one. So here I am in Zoom. I'm going to go to meetings. I'm going to start a little fake personal meeting room meeting. I'm going to hit start meeting. Hit open Zoom meetings. And I'm actually not going to join any audio because I'm recording using Camtasia. <laughs> okay, so notice how the toolbar disappeared already. Host toolbar disappeared. As soon as I stop moving, the host toolbar disappears. That's There was that setting we showed you a second ago where you can make that stay on. Your other option is if you just want it to be on for a while, or maybe during a particular meeting, press the Alt button on your keyboard and it will show the meeting controls for the duration of the meeting. Or when you're done with the meeting controls, if you want them to be hidden, just press Alt again and it turns that off. So down here at the bottom, I have Manage Participants. When I click on that, it opens the Participants panel. Now, of course, I only have one person in the Participants panel, myself. But down here at the bottom, we also have the Chat panel. I'm going to click on the Chat button and it opens the Chat panel. So most of the time when I'm presenting, I have this Participants panel open and I have the Chat open so I can see both of these things. The first setting that I want to show you, the first thing I want to show you how to do is how to transfer files through chat. If you turn that setting on, then the in-meeting file transfer allows you to send files to other meeting participants during the meeting through the in-meeting chat. All you do is down here at the bottom, click this file button. You can either send the file to everyone or you can specify people that you want to send it to. So say there was a handout or something and maybe somebody didn't get it or maybe you just want to make sure everybody got it. You click file. Uh, I'm just going to send this thing right here. Click OK. And now everybody will see that in their chat window. When they double click on it, it opens and they can download it or and read it on the screen or they could print it. The next thing is assigning a co-host. Now a co-host has all the controls of a host. So if you turn on that setting to allow a co-host, a co-host can start the meeting in the host's absence or take over a meeting if the host needs to leave early. There's two ways of doing this. I'm going to minimize the screen for a second. Go back to the previous screen. 
when you're scheduling a meeting so I'm going to go to upcoming meetings and hit schedule a new meeting you can assign a co-host in advance so when you're scheduling a meeting you can assign a co-host in advance and the way you do that is you hit schedule a new meeting fill it all out give it a name the date the time duration etc and then scooch on down to the very very bottom and you'll have this alternative host field here's the thing that's important here you enter their email address but it's not their mvcc.edu email address it's going to be their vccs email address why because zoom is a vccs product and all of our accounts are set up under our vccs email accounts so zoom only recognizes our vccs email accounts so for example one of my coworkers is this Okay, so if I wanted her to be my co-host, I would need to type it in just like that with her VCCS username at email.vccs.edu and click save. As soon as I click save, it'll shoot her an email that has a hyperlink that she can use to start the meeting in my absence. So if you're doing something like a team meeting where you have a meeting that happens over and over and over again, one of these days you're not going to be there to start the meeting. Something's going to happen. You're going to be at a dental appointment or something. You're not going to be there. In order for everything to continue smoothly in your absence, assign an alternative host. Just put in their VCCS email address, shoot them that email, let them know they need to check their VCCS email. Not everybody checks it all the time. Then there'll be a hyperlink right there. They can click on it, start the meeting, and run everything just as though you were there. The co-host has all of the same rights as a regular host. Alternately, if you're in a meeting and you need to leave the meeting for some reason, um, oh, sorry, here we go. If you're in a meeting and you need to leave the meeting for some reason, you can assign somebody else to be the host in your absence. Now, of course, there's nobody else in here, but <laughs> the other person, there would be a little blue button to the right that says more. You click on that more button and one of the options is make host or make co-host. So if you make them a co host or a co-host, then you can leave, but the meeting will continue without you. If you leave and you're the host and nobody else is a host or a co-host, as soon as you leave, the meeting's over. It's done. Everybody else gets kicked out. So in order for the meeting to continue without you, you have to assign somebody else to be the host or the co-host. So the way you do that is you hover over their name, click the more button that would be right here, and one of the options is make host or co-host. Next thing, polling. One of the settings we just turned on was polling. The polling feature for meetings allows you to create single choice or multiple choice polling questions for your meetings. You'll be able to launch the poll during your meeting and gather the responses from your attendees. You also have the ability to download a report of polling after the meeting and polls can be conducted anonymously if you don't wish to collect participant information with the poll results or non-anonymously what's, what's the opposite of anonymous um, if you do wish to collect participant information with the poll of results however it only works if you're requiring registration for your meeting and most of us are not requiring registration with our meetings so as far as collecting the poll results afterwards um, I've never needed to do that. Mostly I just do the poll during the meeting, share the results during the meeting, and we're good. So let me show you what it looks like from the host's point of view, and then we'll talk about how to build them, and we'll talk about some of the limitations of the polls. So I'm going to click Polls right here, and I only have that button because I enabled polling in the settings. You can have up to 25 polls attached to an individual meeting. So this one I have two polls attached. So what you could use that for is you could do like a pre-lecture poll and a post-lecture poll, like a pre-lecture quiz and a post-lecture quiz, just to see if people were paying attention, if they learned anything. Um, you could even use the same meeting all semester long, and you could label your polls week one, week two, week three, week four, week five. And that way you can use the same URL over and over again, but just whenever you're ready to share your, your quiz, your poll, You'd click polls and you'd click the little drop down and you'd choose the appropriate week. 
there's not such a thing as like a poll bank in Zoom where you could just kind of pull up a, a bank of questions in any meeting. The questions have to be attached to a particular meeting. <clears throat> and so that creates some limitations of its own. But so the two ways you can kind of work around that is one, you can either just keep meeting, keep using the same meeting over and over again, and just have a drop down list of all the different quiz banks you want to use. Or you could schedule individual meetings for week one, week two, week three, attach the polls to each meeting, and then you can reuse meetings over and over again. You just edit them and change the date and time. So you could keep using them over and over. Anyway, one way or the other, you've got your poll in here. <clears throat> and down here at the bottom, you click Launch Polling. And you've got a little timer right here. And you'll see how many people have voted. And so it'll go, you know, one, two, three, four, five. And then it'll give you the percentage when as many people have voted as you think are going to vote. You would click Share, you click End Polling, and then you'd hit Share Results and then everybody else will see the results of your poll. You can also relaunch polling to start over again if you needed to for some reason. So polling is fun. It is a little limited though. So one thing that is a little limiting with polling is the kind of questions and also when you can create it. So you cannot create polls on the fly during a meeting. Poll questions must be created and saved prior to the meeting. Is there a way to work around that? There kind of sort of is. Not exactly, but kind of sort of. And it's related to the nonverbal feedback setting. So there was a setting to allow nonverbal feedback. And what that does is see these guys right here, these little yes, no guys, guys right here. These are things people can click on and then they show up next to their names. And so what I've done sometimes in some of my meetings just to have some interactivity is I'll ask questions and ask everybody to click yes or no. So you ask yes or no questions, obviously. Um, ask everybody to use these little icons. And so then you get, you know, sort of a little bit of feedback. Obviously, it's not anonymous. And then you as the host can click clear all and then ask the next question and everybody can vote. Clear all. Ask the next question, everybody can, can vote. So you can sort of do some polling that way, but it only works for yes or no questions. Okay, so to create a poll, because you do have to do them in advance, what you do is, just as we were doing in here, you go to Meetings, you hit Schedule a New Meeting. We're going to call this one Poll Testing. Do your date and your time. And then there's nothing in here that says anything about polls. And you think, what is going on here? Well, it's not super intuitive. What you have to do is you click Save, go back to your list of meetings, find the meeting you just created, and click on it. And then when you scroll all the way down to the very, very, very bottom, you'll have a new thing that says you have not created any polls yet and there's an add button. <laughs> Not 100% intuitive, but that's why I wanted to show you. So you create the meeting, save the meeting, go back in to edit the meeting, and at the very bottom, then you'll have the add button. Click add. The next limitation is that there's only two kinds of questions, single choice and multiple choice. There's nothing more sophisticated than that. So you give this thing a title and we'll call it, um, Desserts. Anonymous, this is whether or not you want people's names to be associated with the with their poll answers. So it's up to you how you want to do that. And then what's your favorite dessert? Single choice. You have to have at least two options. And no more than ten. So pick a number between two and ten. And then at the bottom, you can add another question. Multiple choice, same thing. You have to have at least two options. OK, what <laughs> favorite fruit? Apples, bananas, oranges, cherries. And you can have up to 10. 
And I haven't actually figured out how many, what the limitation is on how many questions you're going to have. You're going to have a lot of questions in your poll. Once you've got your poll done, you hit save. And so now down here, you've got your poll. You can edit your poll. Go in here, add more questions, delete questions, change the answers. Delete the poll to get rid of it. And then you can also add a second poll. You can, so you can have up to 25 polls attached to a single meeting or personal meeting room. If a meeting has more than one poll attached to it, when you click polls during the meeting, you'll be presented with a drop-down list of the poll names. Um, and I think that's it for polling. The, the thing that I wish I had that it doesn't have is it doesn't have an option to collect open-ended open responses. It's only single and multiple choice. So it just, it is what it is. The next little setting I want to talk about is always show the meeting control bar. So remember what I did a second ago, I pressed Alt. You can press Alt to show or hide the meeting controls for the duration of a meeting. If you want to turn it on and leave it on, there's a setting for that. The next thing is the annotation and whiteboard. So I'm going to go to share and you can either go share here or share here. They both do exactly the same thing. When you click annotation, I'm sorry, when you click share, you have all of the little things, all the programs that you have open on your screen that are available for sharing and one of them is whiteboard. When you click whiteboard and click share, you get a white screen that looks like this and you have a new toolbar at the top. This is your annotation toolbar. And what you can do here is you can draw and you can type and you can stamp and you have a spotlight. It's like a, those little laser pointer things. There's also arrows. You can erase individual items. Your formatting gives you all the different colored pencils to use. Whoops, format. Let's see, there's some other things in here too. Let's do uh, some squares. You can undo things, you can redo things, you can clear things, everything, your things, other people's things. And if you set that setting in the settings <laughs> to save your whiteboard, you can hit save. The other thing you can do down here in the very bottom right hand corner is you can make a second screen. So here's a second screen. Let's see, where's my, uh, there we go. Here's screen two. Hit plus again. Here's screen three. And then you can toggle back and forth between screens one, two, and three. Who would use this? Math professors and statistics professors use this. When you're teaching things virtually and you're trying to explain a math problem or a statistics problem, they're difficult to type. It's easier to write them out. If you are a math professor or statistics professor, which we will, what you would probably want to do is get a tablet, like an iPad or another brand of tablet, and a stylus, those little plastic pencil things with the little rubber tip, and then download the Zoom app from the App Store, it's free, log in and host your meetings from the mobile device using the Zoom app. When you share your whiteboard, now you can draw and you can write out your math problems because it's very hard. It's very hard to use a mouse to do this, you know, square root of nine or whatever. Um, the answer is three. I know that. <laughs> uh, okay, and also your participants. If you give them op the option in the settings, you can also have your participants annotating on the whiteboard. What they have to do is on their screen, they'll have something similar to this green box right here only it'll be this green box and then next to it it'll say annotate. I think it'll be up at the top of the screen. So you'll probably have to tell them this. So tell them click the view options annotate at the top of the screen next to the green bar. View options annotate at the top of the screen next to the green bar and then they will get the same little annotation toolbar open and they can also annotate if you want them to. The next thing 
is the nonverbal feedback, and we've actually already talked about that, and all it is is these little icons here that allows meeting participants to communicate without disrupting the flow of the meeting. In addition to the yes, no, go slower, go faster, you've also got this more option, and for the more option you have dislike, like, clap, need a break, and away. And what you will have as the host is above, like if you ask people to vote and three people say yes, right above the yes there'll be a tiny little three. And if four people said no, right above the no there'll be a tiny little four. So you see like the totals when you're looking at the host uh, icons. The next thing is breakout rooms. Breakout rooms are really cool and really fun. Um, and they're going to be kind of really impossible to demonstrate for you right now because I don't have any other participants. But breakout rooms allow you to split your Zoom meetings up into up to 50 separate sessions. The meeting host can choose to split the participants in the meeting into these separate sessions automatically or manually. And the host can switch between sessions at any time. One thing to know though, if you are recording the meeting, it's only going to record the main room, regardless of what room the meeting host is in. So if you're recording a meeting, I would probably recommend pausing the recording while you have everybody in their breakup rooms, because the recording is not going to collect any of the voice or um, video. You're, the recording is literally going to just be looking at this screen in silence for the duration of the time that you're in the breakout room. So I would recommend pausing before you go to your breakout rooms. Breakout rooms are found under the more icon right here. Hit breakout rooms. And you can see you can assign the participants into one or more rooms, as many rooms as you want. And you can do it automatically or manually. If you say automatically and say I had uh, 100 people in here and I said break it into four rooms, it would automatically just randomly split those rooms into groups of 25 and throw 25 people in each room. If I wanted to break them manually, I would say manually. I'm not sure what it's going to do here, but I'm going to click Create Rooms. And the way it would work is Breakout Room 1, I'd click Assign, and there would be a drop-down list right here of all of the names of all the people with check boxes next to them. So I'd say this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. And then I'd go to Breakout Room 2, <clears throat> and it would be a list of all the people except the people that I've already signed to the room. So it would be a list of all of the remaining people that still need to be assigned. And I'd click the drop down next to their name, or the checkbox next to their name. Click, 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 click. And so now maybe half of them have been assigned. So I'd click Assign again, and the half of them that have not been assigned would still be here. Click, 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 click. And then click on the last one, and everybody who's left needs to go in that room. You can also add additional rooms right down here at the bottom, and you have some options. Your options are to move all participants into breakout rooms automatically, to allow participants to return to the main session at any time. So if you turn that off, they're in the breakout room until you let them out of the breakout room. If you leave it on, they have a button that would allow them to come back in the main room, which is usually where you are. Breakout rooms close automatically after 30 minutes, so you can set a timer to automatically tell them, you know, to automatically bump everybody back into the main room after a certain amount of time and you can adjust this number to be whatever you want it to be. You can also set it to notify you when the time is up so it'll go ding dong and let you know when 30 minutes is up. And this is actually a good thing to have, countdown after closing the breakout room. So if you have thrown everybody into breakout rooms, I should say it differently, if you've assigned everybody to breakout rooms and then you click the button that says close breakout rooms, they'll get a countdown timer letting them know that they've got 10 seconds or whatever you've specified here to wrap up their business because then they're all going to be assigned back to the main room. So the other thing to be aware of is once everybody's in their breakout rooms, you as the host are going to be sitting here looking at this screen. You as the host have the option to join the breakout rooms. To get there, you have to hit more breakout rooms. And then you'll see all the rooms right here. And there'll be a button that says join, 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 join. So you can join each room. You can leave each room. When you leave a room, it brings you back here. And you have to go back to more breakout rooms to get back into the rooms if you want to like jump between room and room and room. 
So sometimes when I'm doing breakout rooms, that's what I'll do. I'll say, and I'll tell them before I go, um, before I sign them, I'm like, okay, I'm going to send you to a breakout room. You've got 30 minutes to discuss. I'm going to check on you um, at an interval. Um, and then we're, I'm, I'll bring you all back into the main room at the end of 30 minutes. Oh, the other thing you can do is once everybody's in their room, there'll be a button at the bottom of the screen here, uh, right about here, that says uh, send a broadcast announcement. And so you can send a, a pop-up, a broadcast announcement that's an alert that goes to everybody in all the breakout rooms, letting them know whatever it is you need to let them know. So if you want to say, you know, five minutes, you can send an alert that lets everybody know they've got five minutes left. Um, and one other thing you might want to do with breakout rooms is before you let them go, before you assign them into the breakout room, I usually have everybody muted while I'm doing my web webinars. It reduces the amount of background noise. But right before I send them into their breakout room, I will unmute everybody and then send them into their breakout room. Otherwise, they ha some people don't realize they can unmute themselves, and so they'll all be sitting there in silence <laughs> and not talking. So I usually make a point of, of saying, okay, I'm about to unmute everybody. Okay, you can talk now. Unmute them and then assign them to their breakout room. That way it stimulates discussion. Okay, next thing, closed captioning. Closed captioning is also going to be under your More button. Closed caption. It is only available if you remembered to turn on that closed caption setting. Um, and so then you click on closed captioning and you have the ability to assign somebody to be the closed captionist or yourself to be the closed captionist. Usually the way you do this is you would have contacted interpreters at mbcc.edu in advance and given them the date, the time, the duration, and the URL for the meeting so that your closed captionist is in attendance. Your closed captionist will be here in the participants list. Sometimes they list their name as captionist. Sometimes they'll use their real name and they'll send you a chat saying, hey, this is Bob, I'm your closed captionist. Can you please give me captioning rights? And so then you click assign a participant to type and it'll pop up the list of participants and you click the little setting next to their name under this, it, it would say more right here. You click more and one of the options would be assigned as closed captionist or make closed captionist, I think is what it says. Anybody who needs to be able to see the captions will also have the little CC icon here at the bottom of the screen. And in order to see the caption, they would click on the closed caption icon. It looks a little different for me because I'm the host. But a participant wouldn't have all these icon icons, like they wouldn't have polls, for example. And they would have an icon that says closed caption. They just click on it and that shows or hides the captions. To adjust the size of the closed captions, they need to go to, this is very unintuitive, which is why I'm showing it to you. They need to go to Start Video, Video Settings, and Accessibility. And here they can change their caption font size from normal to medium. The default font size is very, very small. <laughs> so um, again, that's under Start Video, Video Settings, and Accessibility. And they can change it from normal to medium. Attention tracking. I can't show you what this looks like, but uh, what it is is it's a tiny little clock. So hosts can see an indicator that looks like a tiny little clock in the participant panel of a meeting if an attendee does not have Zoom in focus for more than 30 seconds. And what I mean by in focus is, you know how with Windows, you can have lots of windows open, but you're only typing in one window at a time or clicking in one window at a time. The one that you're currently clicked on is the one that is in focus. So if they click out of Zoom and they're checking their email or they're browsing the internet or whatever for more than 30 seconds, they're gonna look at a little clock next to their name. Waiting room. The waiting room feature allows the host to control when a participant joins a meeting. As, as the meeting host, you can admit attendees one by one or hold all the attendees in the waiting room and admit them all at once. And the way it would look is, see how this says participants at the top? If you had waiting room enabled in the settings, there'd be a second heading right here that would say waiting room. Everybody who's in the main room would be under participants. Everybody who's sitting out in the waiting room would be under waiting room. And the way to join them to the main room would be to click on the button right next to their name that says join to meeting. Last, oh, and um, 
while they're in the waiting room, participants will see a screen that says, please wait, the meeting host will let you in soon. Please wait, the meeting host will let you in soon. And you can actually customize that waiting room screen with your own logo, um, your title, a description. Um, while they're in the waiting room, they cannot see or hear anything that's going on in the main room. So they're just sitting out there in a little silent room, literally like a little waiting room waiting to be let in. So you could use that for things like student appointments where you're meeting with one person at a time. The last two things here that I want to show you are recordings and reports. So over here on the left hand side of the screen, back under Zoom, you have recordings. You can record your Zoom meeting or webinar locally to your computer. It'll download as an MP4 file and it'll ask you where you want to put it. Or to the Zoom cloud, it'll say in the cloud as long as you have a Zoom Pro license, which all VCCS employees, students, and staff do. Files stored on the cloud can be accessed on your desktop or from the web. They can also be downloaded. Locally recorded meetings and webinars can only be accessed on the computer that recorded the meeting, which means that you're going to need to upload it somewhere else in order to share it. So if you choose to store it locally, then you need to upload it to YouTube or upload it to Canvas Studio or something like that in order to be able to share it with people. Um, when you choose to record locally, you're going to be prompted to specify the file folder where you want to save the file. And then after the meeting, you can open Windows Explorer or my PC and browse to that location. Double click on it to view the recording yourself. It's just a regular old MP4 file. And then, like I said, upload it someplace else if you want to share it with people. In the cloud, if you want to see the stuff you've recorded in the cloud, you go to recordings. So you log into Zoom, go to recordings. And if you'd like to share a meeting, you just click share right here. Share a recording, I mean. You've got a few settings here that you can adjust. And then you just click copy to clipboard. And this text right here, <coughs> excuse me, text right here will get copied to the clipboard. And then you can copy and paste it to anybody. If you have it set to public, that means you can literally share it with literally anybody inside or outside of the VCCS community. If you click on the name of the meeting itself, um, right here, this is where you can change the name of it. So for example, if I look at this, if you look at this, everything that I've saved in my, every time I've recorded something in my personal meeting room, it just gets the name personal meeting room, personal meeting room, and there's probably a bunch of them in here personal meeting room, personal meeting room. So it would make sense if this is something that I want to find and share that I rename it to something a little bit more descriptive. So you could come in here, click on here, give it a different name. You could download everything here, copy the shareable link right here. So the shareable link is the same shareable link that you saw on the previous screen that you could copy and paste that somebody can view. <coughs> Excuse me. Or if you click on this little icon right here, It'll allow you to view your meeting. Zoom for meetings. What is Zoom? Okay, so you can view it right there. And two awesome things. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see it automatically transcribes everything, which I think is amazing. And it's quite good. Like, it's not 100%. Nothing ever is 100%. But the transcription is quite accurate. If you find anything that's not accurate, you just click on that little pencil to the right and then you could come in here. Like this should say VCCS. You can come in there and you can edit it and make it perfect. The other thing you can do is this little guy right here, set the playback range. If you click on that, this is where you can trim off the beginning or the end or both of your meeting. So that when, you know, if you just have some gobbledygook at the beginning while you're we're getting started, you can trim that off. Or if you had a long Q&A after the session, you could trim that off and then just save the video, um, just the parts of the video that you want to share, just the, the good middle part of it. And then the last thing I want to share with you is reports. You click on reports and the most useful report right here is attendance. It's a usage report. Click on usage and find the date and time of the meeting and click on the number right here. 
and it'll show you everybody who was in your meeting. Sometimes people come and go a couple times, so you can say, and, and so if somebody left the meeting, came back, left the meeting, came back, they would show up in here three times. So you could hit show unique users to get a nice clean attendance list. These phone numbers right here, these are people that couldn't join with the computer audio for some reason, so they had to dial in. And usually when they dial in, they show up as a just a separate phone number, so you can ignore those. But you've got all your people's names right here. One thing that I try to encourage people to do in my webinars is make sure their names are correct. And the way I do that is I ask them to look at the participants list, hover over their name, and click rename. And that would allow them to spell their names out. So I ask them to write their names, you know, first name, last name, using the the name that they used when they registered. So that way I can take attendance a little bit better. Otherwise, some of them are a little cryptic. <laughs> that is the single most useful report. And that is found under Reports, Usage, Find the Date and Time of the Meeting, and just click on the number. And this will give you the list of everybody who was in your meeting. It's hard to take attendance while you're presenting at the same time. So I usually don't even bother with that. I wait until after the meeting and then I take attendance. The other thing is, I take attendance based on the report. The other thing is it shows you how much time people were in the meeting. So if you've got a student, for example, and it was an hour long lecture, and the student was only in there for 20 minutes, or the student was only in there for, I think I had somebody in here for like 11 minutes, may, you know, maybe you don't give them full credit for attendance because they were only in there for like a tenth or I guess a sixth <clears throat> of the lecture. That's up to you. The other report um, is only going to work, um, but your poll testing is only going to work if two things were in place. One, if you were requiring registration, and two, you did a poll in the meeting. So if you required registration and you had a poll in a meeting, then you'd be able to come over here to your poll testing, click generate, and see the see the polling results. Now in my case, it's going to say unable to generate reports since the meeting didn't require registration. So when you're setting up a meeting, that's where you can say whether or not you require registration. You only need that <coughs> if for some reason you want to be able to collect non-anonymous poll results. I've never needed that, so I've never required registration for my meetings. I just send out the URL and let them join. It's up to you how you want to handle that. That is everything. Um, oh, one other thing about polls. Polls don't show in recordings, by the way. So if you are recording your meeting, the polls don't get recorded, like the polling screen doesn't get recorded. So it might be a good protocol kind of thing to just read the poll results aloud after polling is done. Like read the questions, read the answers, and then read the results so that people viewing the recording will know what happened. <laughs> okay, that is everything. If you have any questions for us, please email us at the Technology Training Center. It's Technology Training Center at mvcc.edu. Technology Training Center at mvcc.edu. If you're at a different college, thank you for watching. Please contact your local IT support for Zoom assistance.